is always something uh, great that's taking place here at the Embassy Center. Um, we are a gateway church, um, a church of influence, and we have been for over a century. We turned 115 this year by God's grace. And so this is a legacy. This is a movement, a mission, and a ministry. And we're so glad that the Lord has given us the opportunity uh, to be participants. Uh, we're going to look to the word on today. I want to, I want to ask you to just get as a placeholder, uh, Jeremiah chapter 35, just as a placeholder. We'll get there in a moment. Jeremiah 35, uh, specifically the New Living Translation. We'll get there in a few minutes. Uh, I have what I believe is a a now word, but also a direct word. We've been talking about the fundamentals for the last couple of months, um, the basics, things that are essential ingredients to a fulfilled life as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and we each have an opportunity to continue to grow. I heard someone very astutely point out uh, that the only one that's not supposed to change is God. <laughs> he says, I am the Lord, I change not. The Hebrew writer says in chapter 13, Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. The only one that's not supposed to change is the Lord, but we are always supposed to be changing for the better, going from glory to glory. And so every time we gather, uh, we have an opportunity to receive uh, instruction, encouragement, edifying words that help us to grow, to change. And so my encouragement as you listen, please do so with uh, an open heart. Right? Sometimes we hear with our ears, but our hearts may not fully receive what's being said. And so it's important that we bring our whole self into this particular segment of our worship experience because the transformation happens in the heart, not just with what we receive by way of our head. And the Lord has declared to this house that our next is now. That we have never been where we're going before now. There's an urgency, and by God's grace, his word will help to nourish us so that we can receive what we need to move forward in him. Uh, today's message is going to be entitled, The Influence of a Godly Father. The Influence of a Godly Father. I want to read about a group of individuals that many of you perhaps may not be familiar with, and they are called the Faithful Rechabites. The Faithful Rechabites. The book, Jeremiah the prophet declares, this is the message the Lord gave Jeremiah when Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, was king of Judah. Go to the settlement where the families of the Rechabites live and invite them to the Lord's temple. Uh, not this one, media team. I'm just going to read it. I'm sorry. We'll get there. Take them into one of the inner rooms and offer them some wine. So I went to see Jaazi Zaniah, excuse me, son of Jeremiah and grandson of Habazaniah, and all his brothers and sons, representing all the Rechabite families. I took them to the temple, and we went into the room assigned to the sons of Hanan, son of Igdaliah, man of God. This room was located next to the one used by the temple officials, directly above the room of uh, Messiah, a son of Shalom, the temple gatekeeper. I set cups and jugs of wine before them and invited them to have a drink, but they refused. No, they said, we don't drink wine because our ancestor, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, gave us this command. You and your descendants must never drink wine and do not build houses or plant crops or vineyards, but always live in tents. If you follow these commands, you will live long, good lives in the land. So we have obeyed him in all these things. We have never had a drink of wine to this day, nor have our wives, our sons, or our daughters. We haven't built houses or owned vineyards or farms or planted crops. We have lived in tents and have fully obeyed all the commands of Jehonadab, our ancestor. But when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon attacked this country, we were afraid of the Babylonian and Syrian army. So we decided to move to Jerusalem. That is why we are here. 
Verse 12, then the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, go and say to the people in Judah and Jerusalem, come and learn a lesson about how to obey me. The Rechabites do not drink wine to this day because their ancestor Jehonadab told them not to. But I have spoken to you again and again, and you refuse to obey me. Time after time, I sent you prophets who told you, turn from your wicked ways and start doing things right. Stop worshiping other gods so that you might live in peace here in the land I've given to you and your ancestors. But you would not listen to me or obey me. The descendants of Jehonadab, son of Rechab, have obeyed their ancestor completely, but you have refused to listen to me. 17, therefore, this is what the Lord God of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, because you refuse to listen or answer when I call, I will send upon Judah and Jerusalem all the disasters I have threatened. Last verse, 18, then Jeremiah turned to the Rechabites and said, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, you have obeyed your ancestor Jehonadab in every way, following all his instructions. I'm sorry, 19. Therefore, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, will always have descendants who serve me. Will always have descendants who serve me. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you, Father, for the hearts it will reach. May it produce seed. May it produce growth. Perhaps may it, Lord, even water uh, what is presently growing on the inside of hearts. But we pray specifically for the men in the house, whether they be fathers or not fathers, God, that this word, Lord, will penetrate into their innermost and that it, Lord, will leave a deposit that will be transformative, not only this day, but the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The influence of a godly father. You know, we've been talking about discipleship a lot here at the Embassy Center, and it's important because this is what Jesus established. Uh, You could really say that Christianity is a disciple-making movement. Uh, The command the Lord Jesus gave his disciples upon his leave-taking was uh, to go out into all the earth amongst the the nations, the ethnos or ethne, and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them the things that you've been commanded. So disciples, uh, we have a few different definitions for what a disciple is or a few different ways that you can look at it. And you will have heard this, many of you, and uh, some of you it may be for the first time, and this won't be the last time. So let's take a look at our slides to see how we uh, observe a disciple. We declare that a disciple is a learner, an apprentice, under the tutelage of a master teacher. Jesus was the rabbi, he was the master teacher, uh, and his disciples learned from him. And ultimately, a disciple is an obedient follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our aim, you all. No title is more important than us being known as, first of all, his servants. When Paul wrote to different people, different churches, he declared that he was a servant, a bond servant. Yes, pastor, right? In my case, yes, doctor, and that's earned. That's not honorary. I work for it. (laughs) A couple of them, by the way. All that's fine, but the most important title is servant. And then I would argue that then we need to be, be willing to be known as a disciple, a learner, a follower that's obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons that we've elected to really uh, amplify and and, and really give attention to discipleship is because we believe it's the main thing. And we wanna keep the main thing in the church the main thing. There's a lot of things we could preach about, we we can talk about, but our responsibility is to help equip believers for the work of the ministry. And you cannot carry out the work of the ministry unless you understand and have submitted yourself to a discipleship process. In fact, we are the embassy center, and the embassy center is a governing institution. It is a place of launching. It is a place of release. It is a place where we have declared, in fact, Bishop gave us this language not long ago, that we want to help unleash people into their membership areas of service and into their destiny. But before we can be an ambassador, we talk about being ambassadors in the marketplace and ambassadors in the municipality and ambassadors here and there. But guess what? You cannot represent someone as an ambassador because that is what ambassadors do. 
You have brand ambassadors, there are student ambassadors, there are governmental ambassadors, and they each represent an entity, an organization, a person, and they speak for them. But we cannot represent or speak for the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom if we have not submitted ourselves to first be a disciple. So, disciple first, then ambassador. Then we can accurately represent him. How can we speak for someone we're not listening to? How can we accurately reflect the ways of someone that we've not spent time with? It's a process. And so this is an important, I would say, pillar that I want to make sure that we grab a hold to as a church. We've also been talking about covenant. And we defined a covenant previously as a promise made between two people or groups. We're here because of covenant. The Lord brought Israel out of bondage, out of Egypt, out of their slavery, out of their oppression, and he established a covenant with them that he actually made with their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, when he encounters Moses on the mountain and there's the burning bush and he speaks to Moses, he says, I am the God of your fathers, ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So in other words, the Lord appears to Moses, he responds to Israel, not just because of the situation, but God is a promise keeper. He had to bring Israel out because he had to fulfill his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he brought them out, and one of the first things that he did is he made covenant with them. Let's take a look at the scripture. Uh, The Bible says here, Exodus 19, 5 and 6, he says, Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. The Lord established a covenant with Israel. Let's go a little bit further. Fast forward in the books of the law, Deuteronomy 29.9. He says here, therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all you do. So our prosperity, people of God, is linked to us being obedient followers of the Lord. (laughs) Our success is linked to us being learners, being those who are an apprentice. Joshua was an apprentice to Moses, right? Timothy was an apprentice, if you will, to Paul. This is how we will fulfill what the Lord has given us to do and to become in the earth. One of the the things that I love about the Word of God is it gives us practical examples to help us to understand what God wants. And so what we see is uh, the theme of the Bible, we could argue, is the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. And he chooses or chose to advance his kingdom. He chose to bring about Messiah, the deliverer, the savior of the whole world, not out of a lab, (laughs) Not, not off an invention table or an assembly line. No, Messiah came through a family. We see the first institution established in the the garden is the family, and so I want to declare that family is God's idea. And if families are God's idea, then that means that fathers and mothers are God's idea. Both individuals carry attributes and express attributes that help us to better understand our father God. As a matter of fact, in Exodus 19, he says, I carried you out, I I bore you up on eagle's wings, and I I long, Jesus said to Jerusalem, I long to cover you like a a, a hen covers her chicks. Those are mother attributes, so it's helping us to understand that the glory of God is reflected in both men and women. It's God's idea, but unfortunately, we know that fatherlessness is a sin that has plagued this world for far, far too long. Now, I'm not here to make anybody depressed, but I do want to just establish something because it's going to help us to understand our friends, the Rechabites, in a moment. Bishop Garland Hunt, who actually was just on the the, the promotional material of the the REACH conference that's coming up, he had this to say. Uh, Bishop Hunt is the the, the president of the Frederick Douglass Institute, and he says about fatherlessness. Uh, that right now approximately 24 million, there are 24 million fatherless children in the U.S. That's one in three. In the African American community, 70% of black babies are born to unmarried mothers. 
As a result of fatherlessness, there's many unfortunate statistics, drug addiction, criminal justice issues, behavioral disorders, even abortions are more prominent where there's not a father in the picture. Fathers are important. Fathers are God's idea. Fathers are part of God's biblical order for the family. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the Lord wants to restore fathers, particularly fathers who will be covenant keepers. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.3, he says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Now this is not to be abused, but it is the truth of the matter. Let me say it again. This is not to be abused. This is not for men to lord it over women. But the point of the matter is, make it big again, media team. The point of the matter is, this is the order for the family. The father. Remember, Jesus always demonstrated his submission to the father. He says, I don't speak on my own authority. But the father who sent me gives me what to say and how to say it. He was submitted. He was in order. So God the Father, Christ, man, woman, children. That's the order. It doesn't say to us, God the Father, Christ, man, man, children. It doesn't say Christ, woman, woman, children. That's not marriage. See, the world has flipped this. Satan is very crafty. There's no such thing as same-sex marriage. This is the biblical order for the family. We can call that a civil union, but that's not marriage. Why? Because that's not how God defined it. That's not how God designed it. And guess what? The designer is the definer. If I design a thing, I get to de define what it is. The creature cannot tell the creator what to do. And we know that through various schemes of government, there was a, there was a decision to encourage people in uh, communities of color to not have the father in the home in order to get benefits. Oh, yeah, see, that's why government cannot be your God. Do you know where we're going if certain people have their way, the government is going to be your daddy. The state wants to take the place of God in our lives. And so many people out of desperation, they didn't look for covenant with God, they looked for help from government. And in doing so, they came out of the covenant that God established, they came out from under biblical order. The first thing God did in creation is he established order. Come on, the spirit of God moves through order. There's nothing wrong with order. So if we are out of order, we cannot expect to see the manifestation of the blessings of God. You're out of order. America has been out of order for a long time. Listen, there's some stuff that has to be corrected. Come on, we can kumbaya and hold hands all we want to. But unless we find ourselves being willing to come in submission to the plan of God, there won't be that release that we are looking for. And we'll just be a bunch of religious people with no demonstration of the power of God, a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Don't tell me we're one nation under God and we still call things according to our design and our ideas and our and there's too many believers, we, don't, we, we, want, we, we think the gospel is going to be spread and we think people are going to just convert because we're nice. The Bible says love, rejoice in the truth. We got to start telling the truth. I know I won't get a whole lot of class, but the bottom line is this thing has a trickle down effect. So we need to celebrate if you have a godly father in the house. You need to thank God every day. Because in this culture, that man don't have to be there. As a matter of fact, many of us are surrounded by people all the time who have done the exact opposite that we have done, which is chose to stay. Chose to love our wives. 
chosen to love our children. <coughs> we need fathers. We got to stop putting on the government what fathers and families supposed to do. Oh uh, yeah, I know it's not popular, especially in the black community, because we want the government to solve all our problems. That's why we're doing a shoe drive. You know why? Because we have to rise up and recognize our capacity to help our community. Why should we wait seven months for a grant to buy some shoes when we all could buy some shoes for somebody? We got to flip our thinking, church. The church, the family is supposed to be in the gap, not the government. And as long as we keep begging government to do it, then guess what? Government's going to tell us what to do. <laughs> It doesn't mean that government doesn't have a role. We're supposed to pray for governmental leaders, and we do, and we will. But that does not diminish the responsibility God has given his people. We're supposed to be so blessed that it's really like this. Y'all can help us if you want to, but if you don't, we got this. Our children are going to be good. Let me keep going. If we have God's order, we have righteous families. Righteous families are beacons of light and hope for cities and nations. Now, I want to get to these record bites and we'll be done. The scripture declares that Israel, Judah, they're in trouble with God. Come on, those of you who have siblings growing up, you ever knew that one of your siblings was about to get a whooping? <laughs> It's like the calm before the storm. <laughs> you just waiting until mama get home or daddy get whoever come home. But it's coming. You like they, you got your popcorn like this must see TV. But you can't get too close because you might get it too. Like what you laughing at? I'm not trying to catch a stray mama. I'm just, I didn't do it. But oftentimes that's how prophets were. With their brothers and sisters. Like listen, I told you that daddy said, the Lord has been saying to us, don't worship idols. Don't be involved in this. Don't be involved in that. But just like that hard-headed sibling, they kept doing what they wanted to do. Right? You know, and God is like, I'm, I'm giving really practical everyday language, y'all. Forgive me. This is why you got to go back and read the text for yourself. But it's like, you know, God is like, okay, with the prophets, you keep on campaigning, you're going to get elected. Right? You, 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 you keep on trying me, I, I'm, I'm going to help you see what I really mean. And the day finally came, this is where King Zedekiah and, and the people of God were beset. Jerusalem was besieged by the Babylonian army. Like now it's like, okay, I've been hearing about it. He's been saying it. Now has come time to pay the piper. Now the penalty is about to be assessed because I spoke to you time and time again and you never changed your ways. You never made any amendments. You never adjusted. And so now here comes judgment. But the Lord wants to teach the people that even though the majority of you all are not obeying me, there is a family that's different. And so he tells Jeremiah, he says, basically, I want you to demonstrate that you can be righteous in the midst of everything that's going on. So tell these Rechabites to go to the temple, and I want you to set wine in front of them and tell them to drink. And they say, no, we are not going to drink. Why? <laughs> because our ancestor forbade us to drink. One of our fathers told us, never take a drink of wine. Get this, it's 200 years later. The man is dead and gone, and they are still obeying what he said. So God says in verses 13, 14, he says, go and say to Judah and Jerusalem, won't you learn a lesson from the families of Rechab? They don't drink because their father told them not to. This is powerful. 
When there's biblical order, fathers, your words have authority and they have weight. When you yourself have modeled what it means to be a man of God, when you speak, your children will comply because they see you living the example in front of them. They know that you don't have a lack of integrity with your words. That you're telling them don't drink, but then you turn up. You're telling them don't cuss, but then you cuss. They understood that a standard was established. Wow. The Rechabites honored their vow to Jehonadab. Now, if you want to understand better why this is so powerful, then we have to understand Jehu. But before we get that, I have a chart that I just want to share with you. The Rechabites told their family, sorry, Jehonadab told his family one time, and they obeyed. Let's look in contrast. God spoke repeatedly, and Israel disobeyed. The Rechabites kept their vows made to a human. Israel broke vows and covenant that they made to God. The Rechabites obeyed laws that were focused on temporal things, but Israel disobeyed laws focused on eternal things. The Rechabites obeyed for hundreds of years. Israel disobeyed for hundreds of years. This is the influence of a godly father. That you can live your life in such a way that even when you're long gone, your family stays in alignment with what God wants. Now here's where God's heart was broken. These people, this family has chosen to obey a man of flesh. And here I am, the God of the universe. Here I am, somebody that's indestructible, all-powerful. I supply all your needs. You, they listen to this man and then you don't listen to me. How insulting. How could you? I'm God. Yet this family, because their ancestors said it uh, hundreds of years ago, they follow his word. That's powerful. Men, this is powerful. This is the benefit of godly order. Your words carry weight. Your example has a ripple effect. There are residuals when you abide under the shadow of the Almighty and you declare that he is my refuge. Now, Jehonadab was a contemporary of Jehu. I just want to point out, I'm almost done, the influence of a godly father. If you know about Jehu, Jehu, the Bible says, uh, uh, was anointed to be the king who would destroy the bloodline of Ahab. Jehu was very zealous for the Lord. He was an instrument of justice against Ahab's family. He chose to live a life separate from the worship of false gods. Baalism. Now, when Jehu was beginning his campaign, Jehonadab joined in with him. Now, one thing I know about men, men are going to gather. We're going to go to, I'm not telling you to go here. We're going to go to taverns. We're going to be posted on the corner. Somebody got a nice car, we're going to post up by the car. We're going to be on the porch. We're going to gather somewhere. And usually they say birds of a feather do what? They flock together. So usually men don't really, they don't really socialize with people that they don't identify with as far as values go. We usually tend to group around individuals that we share something in common. People that we know, they feel us and we feel them. So here is Jehu who was on a mission. Jehu was a man on fire. As soon as he was anointed, he took off. As a matter of fact, the Bible says... The prophet told a young man to go anoint Jehu. And he says, as soon as you anoint him, run. Because Jehu was no joke. He was like, I'm killing everything. So so Jehu is in his chariot and he riding through like you with me or you without me. And so he sees Jehonadab. And Jehonadab, I'm paraphrasing, Jehonadab, Jehu says this, are you as loyal to me as I am to you? 
Jehonadab says, yes, I am. He says, if you are, then give me your hand. So Jehonadab put out his hand and helped him into the chariot. Then Jehu said, now come with me and see how devoted I am to the Lord. So Jehonadab rode along with him. Godly men follow other godly men. Right? They don't rock with people that live double lives. Now, it's one thing if you're trying to minister a witness to a person. It's another thing if you fellowship with darkness. Godly men don't fellowship with darkness. We don't find our comfort place in the place of sin. We don't find our comfort place. Listen, if you are a, oh my God, if you are a man that's faithful to your wife, you don't hang with adulterers. How can you be comfortable with men that's sleeping around? How can you be comfortable with men who don't take care of their children? How are you comfortable with that? I'm not just getting in everybody's car. Jehonadab got in the chariot of Jehu because he knew Jehu was not compromising one inch. See, at this time, many people were idol worshipers. And in this culture, we have a bunch of idol worshipers. We put so much above God, and the godly man says, listen, first and foremost, I belong to him. I'm a ride for Christ. I'm rolling with the Lord. <laughs> I'm outside in the Black Range Rover personalized place that say Jehovah. I'm a man of God. <laughs> Jehonadab was a godly man. And because of his love for the Lord, because he feared the Lord, he gave his children instructions. He led his family. He teaches us men Four basic things, I would argue. Let's take a look. Jehonadab teaches us that godly fathers are covenant keepers. Jehonadab teaches us that godly fathers follow godly leaders. Jehonadab teaches us that godly fathers raise godly children who obey God over men. Jehonadab teaches us that godly fathers preserve a spiritual inheritance for their families. The prophet said, Rechabites, because you obey God rather than man. Now think about it. See, some people buckle because a person has a title. They could have easily assumed, here's presumption. Well, Jeremiah is a prophet. So if he's sitting this wine in front of us, it must be okay. See, this is how people get deceived. Because we expect infallibility with men and women who are fallible. Listen, if it goes against the word of God, don't do it. Does not matter who says it. I, listen, I'd rather lose favor with a man than put myself in jeopardy with the one who can destroy body and soul. Do not fear those who only can destroy the body. Eternity is in the hands of the Lord for me. Not anybody here on earth. They could have compromised because the prophet said so. But no. They were devoted to the command of their father. How powerful. So Jeremiah, it was a test, you all. Listen, your loyalty to God will be tested. It will be tested. He's going to see, will you obey man rather than me? Peter and John said, listen, hold on, religious leaders. Come on. We, we, first of all, we can't help but speak about the things we've seen and heard, and we must obey God rather than men. Now, some people appropriate that wrongly, and they out of order. Well, God told me to say it. No, he ain't tell you to say that. God don't have to break order to say something. So some people misuse and abuse that scripture, but the principle is right. God first, then people. And because they obeyed, the scripture says, Jehonadab will always have descendants who belong to the Lord. Come on, man. 
I know you love to give your children material things. I know you would think it's a great accomplishment that you pay for all your children and maybe grandchildren and so forth to go to college and all this good stuff. I know that's something, you know, you relish the opportunity to bless them with a car. Like you want to you be generous. You want to be a blessing. But you know what the greatest blessing is? That after you are gone, that your children are godly. Because if they have God... All these things, what does the scripture say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? And all these things shall be added to you. Amen. If they have the word of God as a foundation in their lives, they will prosper and have good success. This is the Bible. So to know that God is making a promise to you that because of your faithfulness, you will always have children who obey the Lord. Man, that's powerful. That's beautiful. You can rest easy because you know your children are in the master's hands. You know your children, even though the winds might blow and the waves may raise, you know that they keep their hand anchored in the hand of the Lord. This was the benefit of the Rechabites. This was the influence of a godly father. Man, may God give each one of us grace. May God be merciful concerning each one of us so that we stand as godly representatives in the midst of our families that we keep increasing in him. Father, we thank you. Just lift your hands. I'm done. Father, we thank you for your word. And man, I just want to ask you to do me a favor. I know every man in here may not be a father. That's okay. We need godly men. You may not have your own children right now, but maybe you are an uncle. Maybe you're an older brother. You have influence. Maybe you know you know fathers. And maybe this word today can be something that you share with one of them. If you are a male man here, please stand to your feet. And I I just want to ask you to just repeat this after me. This is not, this is kind of spontaneous, but I just said that Jehanadab teaches us a few things. I just want you to repeat this, if you would, after me. I am a man of God. I'm a covenant keeper. I'm a man of God. I follow godly leaders. I'm a man of God. I will raise godly families. I will teach those connected to me to obey God over men. I'm a man of God. I will preserve an inheritance unto the Lord. Now just lift your hands and let me pray for you. Father, I pray for these men. Lord, they represent legacy. They represent history. But they also represent a future. A future, Lord, that only you know. As these hands are lifted up, Father, I pray that you bless these hands. May they be used, Lord, to nurture. May these hands that are lifted be used to heal. May these hands, Lord, that are lifted be used to build things that you want to see in the earth. May these hands that are lifted, God, be used to reach those who are in need of help, God. May these hands, Lord, that are lifted be used, oh God, even for affection where it's appropriate, Lord. For those with spouses with their spouses, for those with children with their children. 
Now, Father, as their hands are lifted in surrender, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you do a work on the inside of them, God, that makes them stronger, that makes them more pure, that helps them to be focused, that helps them, Lord, to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And may they be encouraged to know that their labor is never in vain. May they be encouraged to know that what they do for Christ will last. Thank you for these men. Thank you for their families. Thank you for your goodness to them. Thank you for your mercy. Every day. In Jesus' name. Now, as we get ready to dismiss, man, if you have a special prayer request, I don't want you to leave before you have an opportunity to give that to the Lord. I'm here to pray with you. I want you to know that God loves you. If you've made some mistakes, he forgives you. Jesus paid the price. It's, it's already done. You have to receive it. Man, I want you to know, forgive yourself. As a man, I know we hold on to a lot. I know we are often our worst critics. I know many of us beat ourselves up. But listen, if the Lord forgives you, if the Lord accepts you, forgive yourself. Release yourself and accept his affirmation that you are his man now and tomorrow. If that's you, you can come forward. Let's just wait a moment. If that's you, you want special prayer, please come forward. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We love you. I'm going to remain here for a few moments once we dismiss. For those of you who are going on and to enjoy the rest of this Sunday, I speak a blessing over your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy your Father's Day. We'll see you soon.